there is still a chance of your upper body swinging around and becoming too uncomfortable. So I would always focus on using your hand on whatever object as well. He's not looking impressed. No, he, he can do one arm as easy enough without assistance. So. Very nonchalant. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to another episode of Ask Lattice. We assume a lot of you are watching this from home now and hopefully we can answer some of those questions that you have specifically about what's happening in today's circumstances. So uh, to start with the questions, over to you, Tom. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for asking all these questions. Um, it's been nice because we've got a different set of questions than normal and some of the things that we're gonna go through and uh, I'm gonna give you some of these, you might be a little bit surprised by them. Um, are going to be interesting. So I hope this is of use to everyone. Uh, okay, let's start off with, actually, this is a cracking question just to go right off from the bat. One person has asked, isn't this actually a really good week to rest your fingers? Because a lot of people have been asking us about doing hammering fingerboard. Is this a good week to actually rest our fingers? I think in short, yes. <laughs> If we're being restricted from climbing walls, climbing venues, and everyone's been training pretty hard all winter and usually getting ready for the spring season, for a lot of people around the world, it's getting into a good time to be performing. This is actually when we start to see people transferring to going outside and starting to get little tweaks, or they're right at the brink, pushing themselves to the physical limit. So actually, this might be a really good time to relax, take a bit of a rest, just try and maintain where you're at and just see how it goes. The question is, is this gonna be just one week of rest? That's I think that's the key here, isn't it? Like we don't know what's gonna happen yet with obviously the spread of this virus and the change of restrictions. So in short, yeah, it's good for us having a rest this week, but maybe more than a week is too much. Yeah, I would. I think I'd take it as the approach that lots of us are now gonna have quite a, uh, a change in the stimulus and type of exercise that we're doing for whatever period it's gonna be. So perhaps a really sensible way to do this is to go, right, I'm going to make this change. So let's baseline and get ourselves into a really well rested, prepared state to be able to do some of those changes. There's nothing worse than being, you know, hammering it and then being relatively tired, you know, constantly dealing with this overreaching or over training line that we're all, you know, can be on um, and then suddenly going to a brand new thing. It could be a great time to actually work on something completely different for a week. And we'll talk about, I think, some of the other questions are going to come on that, of other things that we can do aside from fingerboarding. Get a baseline, get really recovered, really feel good, then look at some of these new stimuli. So a lot of the clients I've been working with as well have had all their goals changed and they had trips in the spring period or competitions in particular. The IFSC has stopped all of those competitions for now. So this is a really good time where they are re-evaluating their goals as well and having a rest period is a good time to do that. So push back all your goals to the summer when you think you'll be able to do them. It might not be that long, but we don't know once again, but just have a bit of a re-evaluation, decide on what you need to do. And for some people that are actually struggling at this time in terms of injury or not performing very well, just treat it as the start of the training season again and go, okay, I'm gonna to start to have a rest. I'm already a little bit a step ahead as I were, than I was in autumn. But I'm going to restart all of my training and get ready for when everything opens up again. Nice. Uh, okay, next question is we <clears throat> have been asked, should you do pull-ups and dead hanging at the same time? So almost uh, a question around, is it more efficient to basically do the pulling exercise at the same time as the hanging exercise? Is it beneficial, is it better, or is it worse? So this kind of comes down to that overloading stimulus again. And if you're trying to work multiple muscle groups or multiple factors that you're trying to improve at the same time, you can avoid overloading the thing that you're trying to improve strength in by working another muscle group. So in this example, personally for finger strength and hanging off a dead, rung, uh, dead, dead hang, um, I'd be able to do more weight than I would be able to do multiple pull-ups. So therefore, if I'm restricting the amount of load going through my fingers that are trying to get stronger by adding in pull-ups, they're not going to get the same stimulus as they would by just doing dead hangs alone and then pull-ups separately. Would yeah. you agree on yeah, that? Yeah, I know, I'd agree. That's, that's basically the principle behind this is that 
you're mixing you're mixing a lot of things you're making things complicated i think it's hard to address loading hmm. um and uh in terms of really strong climbers there is a, I, don't, I don't i've always felt like whenever i did dead hanging on small edges and i was also trying to do a pull-up i never really wanted to fall whilst hanging hmm. 40 kilos off my waist on a really small 10 mil edge yeah, yeah. uh not actually not that, that's sort of saying that i'm really strong here uh, let's <laughs> say about 40 kilos on a 30 mil edge uh, i don't want to give the wrong idea there um it's uh it's tricky isn't it so yeah it is tricky i mean don't get us wrong we do have an edge pull-up session that we give out to clients but this is actually as discussed by all our team of coaches we find it better to use in a peak phase so when you've got nice and strong you've made all the adaptations you want to and you just want to transfer that specific strength and keep the finger strength by making it into a pull-up movement but like we said We'll do that leading into a peak or during a peak phase, not to try and get stronger. As a little bit of an extra warning as well, from my personal experience with certain climbers, it can increase your chance of having a tennis elbow, uh, just because the position of most fingerboards, the position of your arms in the pull-up and the position of your wrist and fingers, it can create a bit of tension up here. So please keep an eye out for that if you are doing this workout. Great. Next question. Um, and I have come across this a lot actually over the years of coaching is around is it useful to do some kind of exercise and specifically the one people often ask is core in their rest periods from doing fingerboarding so you might do some hangs um, for whatever it how long ever it might be whether it's a repeater set or just a max hang then should you get down the floor and do two minutes of core or whatever it might be and my answer has typically been for this over the years is that yes that's okay and it's an approach to use but the key factor you would want to look at on this is whether the fatigue that you would carry from that exercise set that you do in your rest period would then affect the quality of subsequent sets or reps on the fingerboard so that would be for me the kind of the caveat on it yes but does it then affect the intensity quality of your fingerboard I guess a good example of that would be doing something like planks, which is a core exercise in the rest, but that kind of works your shoulders as well. Mm. And then going back to overhead and then back to planks, and that can get quite tiring, can't it? Yeah, or uh, front levers in the middle of your dead mm. hanging. Like, there's no way that I would do max hangs and then do some front levers in my rest period. Mm. Uh, I wish I could, but... Yeah, yeah. Mm. Tend to be just a cup of tea and just relax <laughs> yeah. and just chalk up. Uh, okay, uh, another good one, um, and this is particularly relevant to kind of lower equipment climbers who don't have lots of uh, sp uh, stuff that they have at home uh, with fingerboards or pull-up bars, is how do we do training exercises that require one-arm activity, so one-arm pulls, one-arm hangs, but with no pulley or pulley and rope setup? So if you haven't got a pulley and rope set up, the first thing that you're probably going to be looking for is something to use with the other hand. And as the biggest start to this and warning is make sure that it's stable and it's not going to move suddenly because that's going to cause an issue for the hang, hand that's hanging. So if you're going to use, uh, we use kind of chairs or like the edge of a door frame, like pinching that depending on how strong you are or some kind of other system where you can have your hand on the work surface, that's great but make sure that it's stable because you do not want that moving or slipping whilst you're hanging on a load. Mm. The, one of the other things with this is the pulley setup allows you to monitor the load you're using, but whatever you use instead, whether it's a chair, worked up, door frame, you're not gonna be able to really tell and you're gonna have to just base it on feel. That's absolutely fine. Don't get too bogged down in the details of load, just focus on the feeling that you're getting. So if you're supposed to hang for 10 seconds in a 90% repeater session or um 90 percent hang max hang session make sure that you're hitting those 10 seconds properly and you're feeling like it's working really hard if it's too easy you're pushing too much on the object that you've chosen if it if you're the type of climber that really does want to get more detailed and you want to kind of hone in on specifics of intensity especially if you're trying to track that over time i would say you have um two options on that front um that are a hack and they will get you through there one is to use bathroom scales on the floor and if you are so you stand in the bathroom scales and you 
don't hang on your fingerboard. I would, I would measure 70 kilos. If I pull on that fingerboard lightly, I will look down and the bathroom scales will now register 50 kilos, for example. If I pull really hard, I might weigh only five kilos now. So that's a really good sort of digital uh, objective way of measuring intensity for those that kind of work. Um, it is a little bit tricky in that it doesn't have a travel on the movement. It's just a sort of a hanging exercise. So that works on some senses. The other way to do it is to use different grades of TheraBand as assistance. Um, and you can get different, I think they generally come in colors, don't they? For yeah, yeah. Different levels of intensity. So you could move up between different TheraBands to get some kind of gauge on the assistance you get. That would be, I think, my best two objective ways of doing it. Yeah, I'd agree. And for me, you can put your feet on the objects as well. And I would always go for the opposite foot so you stay more balanced. But there is still a chance of your upper body swinging around and becoming too uncomfortable. So I would always focus on using your hand on whatever object as well. He's not looking impressed. No, he, he can do one arm as easy enough without assistance. So. Very nonchalant. 